Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and recording in progress. Uh, Maggie Weller, who will be doing the uh, moderating, and an, our entire mental health team uh, that has spent countless hours over the fall, spring, summer doing planning for this program and for other programs too. And I also want to give a special recognition to the Elizabeth Johnson Prime Spiritual Development Endowment Fund, which also made this program possible. And I want to thank my wife, Judy, for doing all the signing in online and uh, doing the connections of people. Uh, this is going to be about a 90 minute program. We have a number of people online right now, plus we have a number of people here. Uh, there will be questions. The questions will be taken after the presentation. Those of you in person have an evaluation form, which we're going to ask you to complete and leave here. Those of you who are online, you will get an on online evaluation form soon. And we'd ask you to complete those because those online evaluations and in-person evaluations have very, been very integral in terms of giving us ideas of what the plan next. Uh, there will be a small group discussion. Uh, breakout groups, and those will not be taped, but the rest of the program will be taped and they will be available on Central's YouTube line. So those are the introductory comments. I'd like to introduce Maggie, who will go from here with the introduction to Beth. The Reverend Dr. Beth Toller, THD, is an ordained American Baptist minister, licensed marriage and family therapist, and associate professor of clinical counseling and pastoral care at Moravian Theological Seminary here in Bethlehem. Dr. Toller has extensive experience in various academic, ministry, and mental health settings. In addition to her current teaching and academic work at Moravian, Beth currently operates a part-time private counseling practice at the Middleton Center for Pastoral Counseling at Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church. She co-facilitates clergy colleague groups for the Episcopal Diocese of Pennsylvania and other local clergy in Delaware County. She serves as an active member of Laurel House's mainline domestic violence clergy task force and serves as the chair of the Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy Commission of the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education. I'm tired just reading all this. I know, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm, me too. <laughs> Her active writing and research focus on the intersection of race and gender in pastoral counseling, as well as the methodological and practical implications of integrating religion and spirituality into the counseling process. It is my delight to welcome my colleague and friend, the Reverend Dr. Beth Toller to Central Moravian Church with her presentation, When God Disappears, Cultivating Hope and Resilience in the Shadow of Mental Illness. Thank you. And thank you for having me here. Um, it's uh, good to be with you in person and virtually. I was sharing with the group earlier yesterday, I did a presentation for a conference where it was just live streamed and I was, I felt like I was just speaking into a black hole <laughs> and there was, I had no idea who was there, nothing. So it's very, very grateful to, to have in-person um, contact and also um, to have people online. When um, I was working with Maggie and Dick uh, and kind of forming this presentation, um, and then always comes the, well, what's the title of your presentation going to be? And I, I'll, I'll show my, my hand here um, a little bit, if you will. While I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of uh, research and statistics about uh, the work in the field of psychology and counseling as it relates to mental health, and in particular, as it relates to religion, religious and spiritual struggles, and the way that impacts and intersects with mental health, um, this is really a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, both because um, I am a person that lives with mental illness. Um, I've been diagnosed with depression since my mid-20s, and um, I have really done extensive work with my clinical training in psychiatric facilities as a pastoral counselor. And in sitting with 
Um, others who are really living with severe mental illness and also reflecting on my own experience, the experience of mental illness, particularly if you're a person of faith or have any kind of spiritual inclination, very often is an experience in which literally your God disappears. And so in the midst of uh, pain and struggle, how do we understand um, what happens when God disappears? How can we um, engage um, that, that reality? And so, um, the sense of hope um, and faith and, and in a way, mystery and wonder. Hmm. So my hope is today, by the end of this, um, we'll have some food for thought. Um, when I tell my students, I'm kind of a statistic geek. I'm not good at generating them, but I like to read them. And so at the very least, you'll have some interesting statistics to wow all your friends at dinner parties with about <laughs> the relationship between religious and spiritual struggles and mental health. <clears throat> so I'm going to assume most of the people in the room have some kind of functional definition of religion and spirituality. Religion and spirituality, though related, are very separate, right? Religion is kind of our organized, codified, ritualistic, communal ways of being and spirituality. While they, spirituality can have communal aspects, it also can be individually based, right? Um, not have to do anything with God, right? Um, have a, a, our experience of how we feel connected to the world, to ourselves, to the universe, may involve God or higher power. So just also kind of want to make sure we have these terms in our head. Religion and spirituality are separate, but certainly uh, interconnected. And I trust the good people here in this room um, have a, a good handle on that. So in, in the past 25 years or so, there's really been an explosion of research around religion and spirituality and health in general, as well as mental health. Um, those of you who may be familiar with a fellow named uh, Harold Koenig, Koenig, I can never say his name correctly. Um, he's a researcher at Duke University um, and he's really kind of led the charge in this. And we've seen all kinds of statistics of the ways in which things like prayer and by the fact that you're sitting here in this building, you're attending church, um, meditation, those kind of practices literally can have positive impacts on your health, right? So uh, Koenig has found the act of praying helps people get better, mm. faster, and stay better, right? So the outcomes is driven um, in a positive direction that way. But in terms of mental health, they, they found the same thing, right? That uh, there's lots of different research that shows religion and spirituality has a positive impact on our um, mental and emotional health. So just as some examples, um, religion and spirituality uh, helps us have a sense of attachment security, can bring us a sense of comfort, can bring us a sense of meaning, sense of ultimate hope. We actually have a reduced fear of death. Um, and one thing that's really interesting uh, in the research, current research around, um, in particular, um, the experience of discrimination and racism and prejudice from African Americans it's, the studies show that religion actually is a protective factor, meaning that it instills a sense of resilience and allows people to persevere, right, um, and hope and moving forward in the face of discrimination and prejudice. One of the things I think is interesting is we probably know most of these things out of our own experience, but thank goodness somebody did a study to reinforce what we already know, right? Um, so, uh, one study showed, um, in an, in an urban population in terms of the relationship between religion and spirituality and mental health, that, uh, a belief in a higher power or having a relationship with a higher power, a belief in prayer showed significant differences between depressed and non-depressed individuals, meaning that the people who, again, engaged in these practices of prayer and meditation tend to be less depressed than the people who didn't, right? Um, another study, a survey of almost a thousand 
Um, adults in the U.S., 64% believe that engaging in religious and spiritual practices improve their mental health. 60% um, believe that religion and spirituality help them cope with their mental health symptoms. 48% believe their mental health symptoms would not improve until they were religiously and spiritually healthy. Another study um, shows that uh, in terms of counseling and counseling outcomes, um, that actually uh, a counselor, a counselor, like pastoral counselors or people who integrate religion and spirituality into their therapeutic work, um, shows that those kind of therapies were equal, if not better, than the counseling practices that did not pay attention to religious and spiritual issues in the therapeutic context. So what that means is, is that people, again, experience counseling in a more positive way, they experience better outcomes, um, and they also, there's other studies that show that addressing religious and spiritual issues, just merely asking the question, right, um, fosters a stronger therapeutic relationship than if you don't. But as we all know, right, um, there are the benefits of religious, religion and spirituality, um, but there are also the moments in which religion and spirituality may not have such a positive impact on our health and well-being. Right? Certainly, we can think of people who have experienced religious abuse or who are part of religious communities um, that may be more um, restrictive right? in ways in which uh, um, people aren't free to explore and be themselves, right? So there are definitely ways in which religion and spirituality can be harmful. Um, but there's a lot of studies beginning to happen and Ken Pargament and Julie Exline, when we go through these slides, you'll see these names a lot because they're the people who really began to look at this idea of, we know about the benefits of religion and spirituality and how those things help us, but what about the flip side? Right? What are the ways in which when we have religious or spiritual struggles, as you'll see that they're called, um, what impact did those have on our mental health? And what they have found, right, is obviously when we have times of crisis, um, people are not only socially and physically and spiritually impacted, um, but they're psychologically impacted as well. And this is kind of an intersectional, um, an intersectional reality, if you will, right? And so when we have things that happen to our, in our lives, right, um, sickness or tragedy or any kind of, kind of trigger, if you will, um, sometimes we find ourselves asking questions about God, how can God allow this to happen? Am I being punished? Do I even still believe in God? Um, how can I live up to my spiritual values, right? These kind of questions are what are coming to be known in this particular research um, venue as religious and spiritual struggles. And in the last 25 years, um, again, Pargament and Exline um, in particular kind of leading the charge here, um, have found that religious and spiritual struggles not here, maybe it's on another slide, but our religious and spiritual struggles are tied to our mental health and well-being. And how they're defining religious and spiritual struggles as anything that produces tension, strain, or conflict in relation to what people hold sacred. So again, that may or may not have anything to do with God, right? Mm. Can have some sense of questioning who you are in the world. Um, you think about moments in your life when there's been a death or again, if you've had the experience of mental illness um, or a tragedy happens, right? All of a sudden, the way the world was goes away, right? Um, and what they have found is there are explicit and implicit ways that these religious and spiritual struggles get triggered in these moments of pain, trauma, um, 
whatever your personal um, experience is that kind of disrupts your life. So the ex explicit religious and struggles may be why did God allow this to happen? You may feel not, you might, may not feel God's presence. Um, you may have questions about staying in a spiritual community or more implicit questions about who am I? Does my life matter? What's wrong with me? What should I do? I often think, I tell my students when I'm teaching them, nobody shows up to my door to say, let me pay you to tell you how great my life is. <laughs> I mean, I would take that money, <laughs> gladly, right? People show up to my door um, because the way the world was is no longer. And the way they have been moving and breathing and being in the world no longer works, right? And so this sense of, I don't know what to do, who am I, right? In a sense, um, the experience of showing up to counseling is in and of itself, I believe, an implicit spiritual struggle. Hmm. I no longer know who I am. I no longer know who the, what the world is. I no longer know how to really be in relationship, right? And religious and spiritual struggles happen to people across the board, right? It can be prompted by normal events. It can be prompted by marriage or parenting or work or aging. It can be uh, triggered by adverse events, um, illness, death, violence, abuse, um, certainly unjust social realities. We've been kind of living with that the last two years, not just because of the pandemic, because of all of the events around George Floyd and Black Lives Matter really have us questioning who we are individually, societally, communally, um, and even as a church, right? And religious and spiritual struggles can be short-lived or they can last a lifetime. In some sense, when I told you I've had the experience of God disappearing, I'm not sure I've ever gotten God back, right? Um, I'm here. Um, I certainly have faith and I believe, but the way I experienced God and, and who I knew God to be has never returned, right? Um, in some sense, this has been a lifelong journey of me sorting out who the world God is in light of my own experience, right? And it's important to know that religious and spiritual struggles are not a sign of weakness or pathology. One of my favorite uh, quotes, Frederick Buechner, I don't know if you're familiar with him, a Presbyterian minister, a theologian, and he has this great book called The ABCs of Faith. He has an entry under doubt. And the entry under doubt is doubt is the ants and the pants of faith. <laughs> right? Now you can interpret that. Well, I don't know what images come to your mind. <laughs> I have an image, but the image for me is, right? I'm uncomfortable. I'm moving, right? That's a good thing, right? So struggling and doubting isn't a sign of pathology. It's a sound, it's a sign that you're paying attention. Right, and that you're trying to, to make sense of your life in the context of your faith. So Pargament and Exline and all the people who think about these things have come up with what, what's called a religious and spiritual struggle scale. Um, they first categorized the religious and spiritual struggles and then they found a way to measure it. Um, and they grouped these religious and spiritual struggles into three categories, supernatural, intrapsychic and interpersonal. And what's interesting is that these struggles are moderately in intercorrelated. That's a big fancy word to say um, that people who experience a religious struggle in one domain are also equally likely to experience a struggle in another one of these domains. So the supernatural religious and spiritual struggle is around uh, divine struggles or demonic struggles. Mm -hmm. So divine struggles have to do with anger or disappointment with God, a sense that you may be feeling punished, abandoned, abandoned or unloved. Um, and the questions on, in this scale that correlate with this are the four questions shown here. I felt angry at God, abandoned, let down, punished, or questioned God's love. Demonic struggles, or worries that problems are caused by the devil or the spirits and feelings of being attacked or tormented by the devil. And again, the questions underneath, 
um, are the questions that correlate this um, in this religious and spiritual struggle scale. So when you think of divine struggle, right, here are two quotes from um, people I've worked with um, in my own process. Um, I'm suffering, really suffering. My illness is tearing me down and I'm angry at God for not rescuing me. I mean, really setting me free from my mental bondage. I've been dealing with these issues for 10 years now and I'm only 24 years old. Mm. I don't understand why he keeps lifting me up just to let me come crashing down. Two weeks ago, um, a middle-aged African-American male with major depressive disorder. Why did God give me a brain like this? Mm -hmm. Demonic struggles, again, um, two examples from my own um, experience uh, as a clinician. Um, had a, a middle-aged female who also had bipolar. Um, she had, when she wasn't on her medication, um, kind of gone off on a bender of uh, sexual promiscuity and drinking and um, had some affairs and she lost her family basically. And the way her brain um, tried to cope with that is she literally thought she was the antichrist. Um, I am the antichrist, evil incarnate. I have destroyed my world. Um, or a young man I worked with a couple of years ago um, who had an a on, a adult onset of Tourette syndrome, which is very rare, um, but it's awful. And he literally thought, um, I am possess possessed by the devil. He takes control and I spew all things out of my mouth. Hmm. Right? So demonic hmm. struggles. The, the second category, the intrapsychic, right, are things that we deal with individually, internally, that have to do with doubt, where we feel confused about religious and spiritual beliefs. We may feel troubled by our doubts or questions um, about religious and spiritual issues. We may have moral struggles, tensions, and guilt about not living up to our standards or wrestling with how we're following our moral principles. And then there's also the struggles around ultimate meaning, right? Um, does my life really matter? Um, is there any bigger meaning to, to this? So when we think about doubt, um, so a couple of quotes here. Um, I sometimes doubt whether God really exists. I don't understand why he lets little children in third world countries die of starvation and diseases. It seems like he just doesn't care. Or from the Archbishop of Canterbury, is there a God? Where is God? The other day I was praying over something as I was running and I ended up saying to God, look, this is all very well, but isn't it about time you did something if you're up there? A moral struggle, um, an example from um, the moral struggles of Peter Moen. I must recognize with bitter and painful regret how inexpressibly badly I have lived. I have abused everything, time, money, confidence, ability, father and mother's and Bella's love. I have reduced to dust all moral or material values. Ultimate meaning. Um, this is a, a quote from a, a Victor Yalom book. Um, Imagine a happy group of morons who are engaged in work. <laughs> They are carrying bricks in an open field, and as soon as they have stacked all the bricks at one end of the field, they proceed to transport them to the opposite end. This continues without stop and every, of every day of every year. One day, one of the morons stops long enough to ask himself what he's doing. He wonders what purpose there is in carrying the bricks. And from that instance on, he is not quite as content with his occupation as he had been before. I am the moron. He wonders why he is carrying the bricks. So finally, interpersonal struggles. I'm sure there's nothing like this that happens here at Central Moravian, <laughs> um, but conflicts with other people and institutions about sacred uh, issues, anger at organized religion, or feeling hurt, mistreated, or offended by others. Um, Gossiping, cliquishness, I'm sure again not here, hypocrisy, disagreements with doctrine, 
or as this quote uh, is, they, they get off in a corner and talk about you and you're the one that's there on Saturday working with their children and washing the dishes on Sunday afternoon. They don't have the Christian spirit. And of course, I also think in terms of our interpersonal struggle, the ways in which George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, Donald Trump, um, all have caused interpersonal struggles um, in some way. Families literally pitted against each other, communities pitted against each other, right? How do we find a way to relate um, in the midst of this polarized world? So I think we have some handouts. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd like to invite you to do just for a minute, we're not doing the breakout rooms yet, um, but I think we're getting some handouts. And were they emailed off to the people at home as well? People at home. Have. So if you, the people at home want to open up the, the thing I sent, um, if you can't find it, it's okay. You can stare up here. Um, what I'd love for you to do is to just take a minute or two um, to look at these, look at these religious and spiritual struggles and think about, maybe you want to think about what the, what the last two years has been like uh, with COVID or Maybe there is a particularly stressful event going on in your life. Um, or maybe there's a past event you can think of. Or maybe you just want to kind of think about where you are in general in life. Okay, is there any, is there any place where you kind of can, can locate yourself? Of, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I kind of have this, um, I've had this a little bit of this experience. Anybody want to share? You don't have to, but anything that kind of resonates with you as you think about either your current life or the last two years or another point in life? I, I did the, the, the divine struggle, you know, when, when my husband died. Mm. And it sort of rattled down into adult-related struggles, doubt-related mm. struggles, you know. What's the point? Where's my life gone? Mm -hmm. What happened to my story? Mm. Yeah. My story is gone. The story I thought I had. Yeah. It's just gone. Yeah. That was really hard. The death of our son brought out within me several very recent and to some degree maybe even current struggles. The divine struggle, which is a person who lived the type of life that he was just loved by so many people. He, he was very religious. He was involved within, within his church. The ultimate meaning struggle. This is a physician who was, mm. who was healing so many people, and he could not end up healing himself. And the doubt struggle about where religion came into this. Thank you. Else? I oftentimes struggle with the you know, why does God allow yeah. all of this to happen? And I find when um, sharing that in some cases when uh, the cliche responses come at me. Um, I don't handle them well. <laughs> They're not helpful. Yeah. And sometimes they can they, they turn into narratives that can be very destructive, right? So I'm thinking about this isn't uncommon, but uh, I lost my father when I was young. My brother, I was 12, my brother was 16. And you know, someone said, well, you're the man in the house now. Ooh. Right. And that <laughs> didn't go well in lots of different ways, right? But that narrative right, um, well-meaning people, right, <coughs> um, yeah, I, um, if I can just add to this, it's just gone my memory of uh, a friend, a dear friend of mine just recently lost a friend of hers, mm -hmm. whom I knew, but not as close, and my dear friend went to the funeral, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, priest at the funeral was 
sharing how happy this individual who just passed away is because this is what she really wanted. And my friend is telling me this and she's curious. And she says, Diane does not want to be in the ground. Diane wants to be at the casino. <laughs> Yeah. So don't tell me this is what she wanted. Right. She didn't want to die. She right. wants to be at the casino. Yeah. So I, this conversation just reminded me of this. It simply happened two weeks ago. Yeah. I find in, uh, in the work that I do, the, the why is God punishing me? question and 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 even though that's not part of my theological grounding it's not part of the churches that i've been a part of it's not part of that theology and yet that sort of conclusion is so easy for people to go to and it's really hard to help undo it yep very much so yeah, I, I, I'm a signer for moral struggles. Uh, I was married for 40 years. My wife died about two years ago. Yeah. And uh, being married, you, you lose track of, you know, it's just every day you, you just go through the way you are. And then uh, when Nita died, I was on my own. And I discovered that the higher standards that we were living up to during our marriage, mm. um, it was a lot tougher being single, living up to those standards. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was like, wow, man, am I really being faithful to God or was I being faithful to Nita? Mm. You know, kind of thing. So uh, I don't struggle with it or anything, just something you think about. Yeah. Boy, I'm, I'm not as. Uh, altogether as I thought I was because <laughs> right. my faith wasn't about I'm exaggerating it sure. but okay was my faith really about God or was my faith about loving my wife mm. so then you have to kind of reorient that so yeah for sure interesting thank you um, I'm assuming there's no chat feature or, or people popping in on the chat or they'd like to they haven't posted comments as well okay uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, so, yes, there is a post, the hope that the progressive Christian church could provide more vocal leadership. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, again, so this... And oh. so, Beth, I should point out that... Um, if anybody wishes to make a comment, they can just unmute themselves oh, okay. and speak freely. Great. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak freely? So uh, again, this uh, these six domains right have questions that go with them, and they would be on a five point Likert scale, um, and this study has been done and replicated. I mean, I, I could have spent all the time telling you all the ways in which this study has been replicated and all the context about religious spiritual struggles, um, but I'm just going to kind of give you some highlights here. So what they found, right, is religious and spiritual struggles correlate higher with physical and psychological distress. So people who report uh, high levels of spiritual struggles are at greater risk of mortality. Uh, they have higher rates of depression, anxiety, hostility, interpersonal sensitivity, paranoid ideation, PTSD, OCD, somatization, and suicidality. May I ask a question? Sure, yeah, sure. I may not know the answer, but I'll give it a whirl. Um, do, do these studies take into account other factors? Like, for example, I thought about physical illness. Uh, where people have, have to take high doses of steroids. And steroids uh, notoriously and actually are terrible with your mood and with your feelings and all that kind of stuff. So does that, I forget the word for it, but can, can 
and those psychological studies, does, does it X out and take out the effect of drugs like that? It doesn't necessarily X them out. So I'm gonna show my hand here. I, I, I can't do a deep dive with you in some of these studies, so I can pull them up on my computer and go through them with you, some of them. Um, they don't necessarily X them out as much as um, uh, separate them out, right? And so kind of, they do factor those things in, um, but they don't necessarily let that be a predictor because the, re the religious and spiritual struggle is still there, right? But they, there may be- um, There may be magnified. Right, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Right. That, is, that is a part of uh, the interpretation, if you will, um, of some of these um, studies. So in 2015, um, this was probably the first widespread um, application of this religion and spiritual struggle scale. They sampled 2,200 people and all types of religious and spiritual struggle were tied to greater depression, greater anxiety, less life satisfaction, less happiness. And there were controls, like you were mentioning uh, in this particular study, for religious commitment, neuroticism, and social isolation. So the, the things that are continuing to, to emerge um, as the study gets applied to different things is that there is no significant difference in religious and spiritual struggles based on gender, age, ethnicity, or religion. There may be um, differences in which religious and spiritual struggles um, may um, a particular group may experience, but in terms of the across the board correlation um, between the struggles and the relationship to, to mental health, there's no significant difference. Um, in terms of sexuality, LGBTQ um, folks report higher levels of religious and spiritual struggle than non-LGBTQ folks. We can imagine some of the reasons why that may be. Um, atheists, they actually do have religious and spiritual struggles. Um, they, uh, their scores, uh, they tend to be higher on the interpersonal struggles, right? Um, than on obviously divine or um, demonic or those things like that. Another interesting thing in terms of uh, ethnicity or race is African-American reports higher levels of religious and spiritual struggles and or but, depending on which word you want to use here, they have lower levels of anxiety, higher levels of happiness, and less physical symptoms than white and Latinx folks. <laughs> um, so thinking about some of the common religious and spiritual struggles among, Muslim, among Muslims, um, again, a 2006 study, um, uh, of the people who were sampled, 40.2% felt as though the devil or an evil spirit was trying to turn them away from what was good. 38% questioned whether life really mattered, whether life really make a difference in the world. Um, they worried that their problems were the work of the devil or evil spirits. Um, and they felt as though God was punishing them. Um, the correlates, um, there were higher levels of uh, depression, purpose in life, angry feelings, positive relationships. Uh, if you can see the alcohol use um, goes up here and that there is poor physical health. Um, among Hindus, a 2003 study showed higher levels of depression, um, life, this is interesting, higher levels of depression, um, but equally higher levels of life satisfaction, but lower marital satisfaction. Common religious spiritual struggles among Jews, um, angry at organized religion, um, questions about ultimate purpose and meaning. Um, they felt troubled by doubts or questions about religion or spirituality, and they questioned whether their life will really make a difference in the world. Uh, there was a small study done with cancer patients. 58% um, endorsed the spiritual struggle. They wondered why was God allowing this to happen, feeling abandoned by God, angry at God, questioning God's love for them, and feeling that cancer is a punishment from God. So in summary, right, we can see that spiritual struggle um, is positively associated, meaning 
more the more the spiritual struggle, um, the higher forms of psychopathology after the control factors, um, and that there the relationship between spiritual struggle and psycho psychopathology is stronger for individuals with recent illness or injury. So what? <laughs> it's the ultimate meaning question, right? What do we do with this reality? So we could view this and take this as bad news, right? And meaning, well, we should not have religious and spiritual struggles, right? So that we can be happy and not be anxious. And so let's just keep it moving, right? Um, this is where I propose that as much as religious and spiritual struggles um, do cause um, or have a, a relationship with psychopathology, that they're also invitations for us to grow. Um, and we should see them as opportunities to grow. The first thing that kind of, um, when we think about what do we do in the, fit, in the midst of our religious and spiritual struggles is very often, um, and this is very often the people that land on my door, remember not showing up to tell me how awesome their life is, <laughs> is they're trying, and we do this all the time, we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. The round hole being our life before, X, whatever that is, right? Um, and that in and of itself, I think is what kind of gives rise um, to some of these, makes the religious and spiritual struggles worse. So really um, understanding that the way in which you connected with God or you um, connected the higher power, whatever that kind of language, language is you wanna use, you have to find some new ways, not just to think about how connecting, but you may also have to find new ways to think about God and religion and spirituality in general. You cannot put a square peg in a round hole. So engaging religious and spiritual struggles from a, from a place of faith, um, to me, um, is really an invitation to enter into the very heart of God. Um, I, I gave a, a Good Friday sermon um, and I, I wanna share a little bit of it because this is when I think about the opportunity of religious and spiritual struggles and the experience of mental illness is an invitation to enter the very heart of God. I'll just go ahead and say, you probably don't, Clifton, you don't want me to be your Good Friday preacher because <laughs> I really take seriously that God died, okay? Um, it's not good news um, when I stand up and preach on Good Friday. So as I stand here before you today, and what I would call the shadow of mental illness, the shadow of religious and spiritual struggles, the shadow of the crucifixion, I want to confess very clearly and plainly that in these moments, God does indeed disappear, dare I say, die. Jürgen Moltmann, who is one of my favorite theologians, um, captures this reality best in his book, The Crucified God. When God becomes man, his language, not mine, in Jesus of Nazareth, he not only enters the finitude of man, but in his death on the cross also enters into the situation of man's God forsakenness. In Jesus, he does not die the natural death of a finite being, but the violent death of a criminal on the cross, the death of complete abandonment by God. The suffering and the passion of Jesus is abandonment. It is rejection by God. So why? Why would God die? Why would God do that on the cross? And what meaning could we ever make? 
I propose via Mulvan and via my own experience that God dies on the cross in an act of solidarity with us. In an act of solidarity with the human form and the human experience. In a supreme move and act of divine empathy and relationship, God experiences death, not just so we can ultimately find and know God, but also so God may find us. I'm going to say that part again. God does not experience. that God can find and experience and know us in all of our God forsakenness and all of the ugly glory of our lives. In the cross, our pain meets God's pain. Our suffering meets God's suffering. Our forsakenness meets God's forsakenness. The experience of mental illness in particular the experience of mental illness in light of our faith and light of our religious and spiritual struggles is an invitation, not just for us to rediscover and know God, but that God meets us in that place of forsakenness. Because in the deep, dark depths of despair, we are abandoned. We are forsaken. God has, in fact, disappeared. The question becomes, as God has disappeared, how do we cope? How do we find the resources to begin to move forward? And this is where um, I think I was kind of maybe born in the wrong religion. Our Jewish friends have got this right. The Jewish religion on the whole, somehow, I don't, you know, we were, Christianity was born out of Judaism. I don't know how we lost our theology of protest. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Hebrew Bible, it is chock full of the people of Israel just giving God what for, right? That there's this idea that God can be approached and that there's freedom and liberation to be found in shaking your fist at God. So our first move in this place of God forsakenness, our, this place of religious and spiritual struggle, is finding our freedom with God and rediscovering what I call, that someone else said way before me, right, that I can't remember. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you the right quote or the right name. But this idea of a theology of protest. So I want to play a clip. Um, which means I need to, what does that mean that I need to, this is not the same as being on two. Yep. This is one of my favorite movie clips of all time. <laughs> is the sound going to come through Hudson, hopefully? Fingers crossed. Yeah. Now they'll just set. Oh, if you you play the sound and we'll just listen to your laptop, but that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you max the volume on your laptop, where the hell's this guy here? It's funny. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Dan said that. Yeah. 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 I was scared. He was Anyway. 
If you're willing to pause, I'll play it for the folk on Zoom. I think I might have found the clip on, okay. on YouTube, maybe. Welcome home, Stephanie. I I just I texted you that Kitty threw up, but she threw up. He threw up on the floor and then he left right away. But he didn't finish his dinner. <laughs> yeah, right on the floor. Please bear with me. I'm listening to a mental health presentation and she's working with Jürgen Moltmann's uh, the, Abandon, the Abandonment of Christ on the Cross. And it's very interesting. I, I, she's very close to Focolari spirituality. I just yeah. muted him. Good. Wait, I was getting some good prompts here. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you need to catch my... All right, I think I have it. <laughs> so you'll end up hearing it twice. But... That's okay. That's okay. No shrimp. Where the hell's this god of yours? It's funny Lieutenant Dan said that, because right then, God showed up. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan, he was mad. You call this a storm? Oh, you son of a bitch! Oh! It's time for a showdown! You and me! I'm right here! Come and get me! You'll never see this bomb! So, besides the fact that, that yeah, that's my, my one of my favorite movie clips of all time in terms of thinking about finding freedom with God in terms of our emotional reality and uh, reclaiming this theology of protest. To me, you know, the, the Book of Job is something that we, we talk about what's thrown at you in the midst of uh, of, of of suffering, right? Uh, Job comes up a lot, right? Well, the, the power for Job and Job for me. You know, is it, uh, uh, you know, is it that he was long suffering and isn't that he was faithful, whatever that means, is that he literally dared to shake his fist at God and God showed up, right? Um, so this idea, I don't know where we lost anger. I don't know where we lost our emotions with God, um, but I invite you in this experience to think about in terms of your own religious and spiritual struggles of things not making sense anymore, of, of, of there being a square peg with a round hole, is that you can um, shake your fist at God and, and God will show up, right? You may not feel God, right? Again, I'm still working on the, I, I grew up Baptist, so um, God has left the building in terms of like, I feel God, I, I, I don't feel God anymore. But I know that I shake my fist and I know that God still shows up, right? So thinking about our relationship between our emotions and that we can open those up to God and that there's no emotion kind of off the table, I think is really important. So finding our emotional freedom with God and reclaiming um, our theology of protest. And I'm sure Hopeton leaves lots of space and room for, uh, for people's anger um, and, and whatever with God. So the other thing when we find ourselves in this place of religious, severe religious and spiritual struggle is to think about what our resources are. And when we think about resources, there's a, a way we can think about our internal resources 
and our external resources. Our explicit spiritual resources and our implicit spiritual resources, right? So our internal, but maybe explicit spiritual resources may be that we you know, have a set of beliefs or we have a meditation practice, or we really do have this sense of connection with God that we can tap into, right? Or internally and more implicitly, we may have a sense of feeling of purpose, of hope or patience. Um, our external resources, uh, rabbis and pastors, sacred sites, meditation groups, um, faith communities, um, our implicit external resources may be your family or friends or a book group or a running club or a hiking, right? Getting out in nature, right? So really being intentional about discovering your resources and how do we do that, right? Really asking the questions of ourselves or others that we may be working with. My favorite question to new clients is what is it that gets you up and let you put one foot in front of the other. What gets you out of bed? For some people, it's a cat, a pet. Um, for some people, it's a sense of, I have to provide for my children, right? What, what gets you through? What literally is what gets you out of bed, right? Just a question like that. What brings you joy? What nurtures you? When do you feel most alive? Where do you find peace? What gives you hope, right? What, who truly understands your situation? Where do you turn for comfort? And for what or for whom do you feel deeply grateful? Now, in the experience of intense religious and spiritual struggles or the experience of in, intense mental illness, right, these questions may feel empty, right? But there are ways in which um, there are people and resources around you where, again, you may not feel hope, you may not feel peace, right? But there's a, a way in which you're reaching outside of yourself um, to give you a sense of, I'm going to get up out of bed um, because of X, Y, and Z. You may not feel very spiritual at all, right? Or feel like God is showing up. Um, square peg, round hole. Do you need to find new resources, right? Um, I think we discovered, or I discovered this uh, in the pandemic. Um, when things began to open up in Philadelphia, and uh, the church that I go to um, is the uh, Lutheran Church of the Holy Communion in Center City, and I facilitated a, a series of just kind of regathering groups, right? And beginning just to say, well, what, how, what was this like and what got you through? And the ways in which people had to reimagine and rediscover, right, ways of connecting and ways of being, right? So walking became a huge thing for a lot of people in the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, people took sewing up uh, or cooking, right? Um, I don't know if you remember all the stories, all the flour flew off the shelf because everybody was like, oh, I'm gonna learn how to bake, right? Right, so, but in a sense, that was discovering a new resource um, to help get you through a particularly hard time, right? Going back to my own experience, I have this vivid memory. We all know memory is a tricky thing, but for some reason, I have myself pictured in my dorm room in college. It's dark. I'm on the phone, not a cell phone. I am too old to have a cell phone in college. <laughs> that wasn't a thing. Um, and I'm on the phone with my youth minister. Um, what I didn't realize I was telling him was that I, I was depressed, right? The only language I had was, is I don't feel God anymore. So he sent me a pamphlet on how to get over spiritual dryness, right? He should have sent me, <laughs> he should have said, go to the counseling center, <laughs> but whatever, right? But what, what I'm getting at though is I could, the, the spiritual resources I had growing up as a kid, which was read your Bible, do your quiet time, pray, go to church. All of those things just didn't work, right? And so in a way, I had to find new resources. And so it's not just about going back to old ones, but maybe you have to find new ones because the old ones don't work anymore. Here's something. What is your spiritual personality? Right? 
going again, back to my experience of being raised Southern Baptist, um, reading the Bible, going to church, doing all the things, right? Not a part of my spiritual personality, it turns out. <laughs> I'm not good at waking up early. I'm not good at routine, right? Um, which explains a lot why I felt like I was constantly like in the doghouse with God growing up because I couldn't sustain my daily practice, right? What be be curious about what is your spiritual personality? You have one, believe it or not. Um, and while there's no necessarily widely accepted resource for like let's assess your spiritual personality, there are ways in which we can think about that, right? So in personality uh, theory, so to speak, there is this thing called the five factor personality model. Um, and it and it basically is is built on the idea, are you open to experience, which means are you inventive and curious versus consistent and cautious? Um, are you conscientious, meaning are you efficient and organized or more easygoing and careless? Probably me. Uh, <laughs> extroversion, um, are you outgoing and energetic or are you more solitary or reserved? Um, on your agreeableness, are you more friendly and compassionate or are you a little challenging and detached? I love how they chose those words, challenging and detached, right? <laughs> we could fill in other words probably for that. Uh, neuroticism, right? Are you sensitive and nervous or are you a fairly secure and confident person? And how does that help you kind of think about um, your spiritual personality? Are you a spiritual explorer or are you more of a spiritual homebody? And again, there's no judgment here, right? There's not one is better than the other. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, do you approach your spiritual life in a structured and intentional way, or do you just kind of wait for spiritual experiences to happen as they happen? Do you find spiritual nourishment more in groups, in service, or more in solitude and contemplation? How open-hearted are you, or how guarded are you? Um, is it easy for you to trust or difficult? Do you carry an excessive sense of guilt or worry about making mistakes? Or do you seem at ease with how you live and who you are in God's eyes? And the one thing I want to say about this, on one hand, kind of being clear kind of about what your spiritual personality is, again, kind of gives you freedom, gave me freedom of like, oh, well, maybe I don't have to read my Bible every day in order for me to be spiritually nourished, right? Gave me some freedom to explore and do other things. Um, but it also uh, helps you think about maybe ways in which you should grow or stretch, right? So even though I'm probably more on the extroverted end in terms of how I find my spiritual nourishment, right? The other piece of that is allowing myself maybe to be challenged to be more contemplative and silent. So not thinking about these things, or well, this is who I am and this is how it's going to be, but maybe letting yourself stretch in the other direction as well. Seeing that the spiritual personality will change because again you're talking about this is the way I was. Mm -hmm. I've been into the round hole. Now I don't because of what his life experience. Absolutely. Is. So that there's that elasticity. Absolutely. In your spiritual personality. Absolutely. So what I was talking about this idea of like locating yourself and then maybe letting yourself kind of grow and stretch in the other direction. You're probably familiar with the Myers Briggs, right? Well, that I think it's, it's based on Jungian archetypes, right? And most of us kind of misunderstand, like, well, I'm an ENFP and this is who I am, and you better deal with me. Well, right? So um, <laughs> that really only goes so far in my relationship. It worked pretty well for a while and doesn't work so much anymore. Um, but the idea is Jung and the Myers Briggs is really that you're you're meant to locate yourself so that then you can also grow into the other direction, right? So for me, um, I have come to value, right? Um, contemplative practices, right? And more kind of introverted ways of being. I've tried to develop that within myself. Um, so again, not only do you grow and change based on your life experience, there's a way in which we can kind of think, again, how do we need, how do we need to grow um, and stretch ourselves? So the last, not necessarily last exhaustive thing, but the last thing I'm going to hold up for us this evening is this idea of making meaning. 
right? Our experiences in life, particularly the things that cause us the most pain, um, that cause our religious and spiritual struggles, right? In the, in the sense of um, being open and seeing this as an opportunity for growth, right? Here are some questions that I think are really important to help us and help other people begin to make meaning of their experience. So what are the deepest questions your situation has raised for you? What have you experienced in this situation that you find most troubling? What causes you the greatest despair or suffering? How has this experience changed you at the deepest levels? What would you like to be able to let go of in your life? And these last three questions are actually mine. What ties you to the old? And are you willing to discover a new part of God and a new part of yourself? And what will help you cultivate patience and compassion as you wait for this new life? This is the question I'd like to leave us with today. Mm -hmm. What will help you, what will help us cultivate the patience and compassion as you wait for the new life that comes out of your great pain? And great start. So I do have an activity, but I'm also, don't look at me, I haven't gone over time. Um, I would, I will open it up for um, some questions and then I'd like to close with a, a reflective activity. Any questions? So Cheryl has a question. It might be easier or a comment, I should say. It might be easier if Gerald would just unmute himself and speak freely. And Barry, you're next. Good evening. Uh, I have spent two years on the Book of Job as a master's thesis at Moravian Seminary 35 years ago. And uh, I came to appreciate Jewish theology as you have <clears throat> and the theology of protest. But it seems to me that there are resources in uh, mystical theology in the history of the, the wider international church that may be of, of help uh, because the via negativa and the via positiva are classical understandings of how life experience in Christian encounter is to be embraced. And your treatment of Jesus forsaken in Moltmann is very meaningful. And it has contemporary and 20th century understandings in the Christian church that, that I have encountered that are helpful. But putting them into North American context from the international church is a serious challenge. Sure, yes. Um, for those, do you all know the Via Negativa? So uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sorry what your name is, but the gentleman was sharing this idea of the Via Negativa negativa versus positiva, and the negativa being that we discover from a place of emptiness and not knowing, right, rather than um, from a place of, of knowledge and revelation. Um, and so you're right, a, a piece of what I'm um, proposing is that we are coming at this from the underside. And of course, you know, John, John of the Cross and the Dark Knight of the Soul is a great example of that. Um, so thank you for that, yes. And Barry had a question or a comment. Barry, just unmute yourself and go right ahead. Yes, uh, I, about a year ago, read Rabbi Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I connected to was the concept that God may not actually, I, I mean, I certainly don't profess to know these things, may not actually control every single human event that um, he gives us the mechanism whereby when bad things do happen, as they often do, even to good people, uh, he gives us a mechanism to connect with him, to draw closer, to engage with him and to feel his power in our lives. So I, I was just wondering uh, 
Dr. Toller, when you were speaking about how people see demons in their lives and and attribute God's actions in the sufferings they are experiencing. And it, it just struck me that, you know, uh, it's sad if they feel that way because it might not be God sticking the pins in them. It may just be life. And, you know, it, and, and what I just said follows God's, God's being there for them. Right. So thank you for raising that. I think um, my just kind of off the cuff response to that is um, when you're in the midst of that intense religious and spiritual struggle, like I'm thinking of the man with, with Tourette's, um, thinking about, again, my own experience. Um, in fact, what I call my face shattering experience in college, I was in a class I really had no business being in, in terms of level of, I thought, I thought I was taking a class that was going to teach me how God created the world when we really, we were looking at like creation in much bigger context. Um, so the professor was like, who's a dear friend and mentor of mine now, um, was proposing that perhaps God was not in control of the world. Well, and up until that moment, the way I'd gotten my head around what had happened to my father, who was killed in a car accident, was in fact that somehow this was happening for a reason and whatever. So the professor is up doing his thing, and I literally um, stood up in the middle of class. Um, and I hope you'll um, excuse the <laughs> that comes out. I literally stood up in the middle of class. And I said, well, if God is in, not in control of the world, then you tell me what the hell happened to my dad. Mm -hmm. And I stormed out. Um, and that, that was the moment, right, where I really, where everything kind of came shattering down. And I share that story um, because what I found, again, from my own experience and people living in the midst of, like, God has punished me, like, this, this, the moment of struggle is not the time. Um to introduce the idea that maybe God isn't doing this, mm -hmm. right? The, the power and the fortitude of someone being able to show up in the midst of those questions and being present and letting those questions be asked and having the patience and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and what I have found is that gradually people may come to a different understanding um, and they may never <clears throat> feel or experience um, God in the way in which you're suggesting or in the way in which they have before, right? But again, that idea of, of patience in the midst of suffering um, to sit with, if you want to go back to Job, you know, I mean, his friends could have done a little better, but they did show up, right? Um, so thank you, though. I hope that helps. My lighting isn't very good, but I, I would like to comment uh, on something that Abraham Heschel taught me. He said that there is a, uh, Abraham Heschel is a prominent uh, contemporary 20th century Jewish scholar. And, uh, he, he said that there's a difference between a question and a problem. A question mm -hmm. is too little information and a problem is the result of too much information. And mm -hmm. I found that in my struggles with biblical study and um, spiritual reflection to be helpful because uh, when life begins to change as rapidly as it happened to be, happens to be unfolding right now, I'm aware that I have problems that result from too much information and questions where I have too little and I, I have to find a balance. Thank you. I'm going to, I guess I'm stealing that from Heschel, but via you. So thank you for reminding me of that. Anything else? So what I'd like to do, um, we have just, we do have a few minutes. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, for you to go back. I don't know if the, the hand, go back to your handout and I'll take us back to, uh, well, um, am I, when I change this, does it change on your 
Or I'm going back with okay, you. Okay, you're going back with me. Um, so, so I'd like for you to, to kind of go back to, to your religious and spiritual struggle that you kind of identified. Um, and then, and let's look at it through the lens of, right, um, this idea of, of spiritual resources, right? What are your resources? What has gotten you through, right? Um, and if we think about this idea of um, spiritual personality or developing new resources, um, what has your experience been with that? So I don't know, um, there's looks like three kind of breaks up three, three, and three. Um, maybe if you, and, and I don't know how you want to break them up um, in the room. I'll let you figure out. No, I mean the breakout Online. room. Online. Oh. Um, so to share maybe a little bit of your religious, you know, what struggles you're having. So what struggles you may have experienced either now or in the past. What were some of the resources that got you through, right? Um, and as you kind of maybe consider new resources, um, what, what new resources have you discovered? And how may this idea of the, the spiritual personality, if you will, how, how is that impacting you to shape thinking about developing new resources from here on out? Does that make sense? What's your religious spiritual struggle? What were your resources or are your resources? Have you discovered new ones? And then based on what we've kind of talked about tonight, this idea of spiritual personality, you know, um, how may that inform you to think about um, even newer resources? So we'll take a few minutes to do that um, and then we'll come back. You can have a cluster over there, cluster here. Okay. Cluster there. How many would you like in a group, yeah. more or less? Three is three. Yep. <clears throat> and how long will we? Uh, I'm not good at this part. What do you think, Mike? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So for those who are on the Zoom, you're going to be in groups of three, and it will run about 10 minutes. Uh, the downside is that there are two people who are showing up online that cannot be in a group. So I'll have to go back and fix that afterwards. Gerald Stover here. Will we be able to see the people we're dialoguing with in, in the virtual group? Uh, yes, as long as they turn their cameras, cameras on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Okay. My struggle is just a problem. I'm sitting here with a major memory. For those people who be in emergency room, but after 39 years, I have learned to try to go on, even though I've been through some bad hosts of the day, but I know I needed it more tonight, and I would feel very badly if I didn't. And my question isn't like, God, why did you do this to me? It's more like, you know, pray to God that you can be relieved of this. And after 39 years and watching my daughter suffer for 23 years.
So this is one of the <laughs> uh, it's probably one of those moments where I know we're at time, but also uh, I always get accused of not giving enough time for breakout rooms. So uh, thank you for not moaning and groaning when you came back from your Zoom room. Uh, <laughs> students, students moan and groan a lot. Um, anything you want, would want to share out of your conversations? Not necessary, but curious. Actually, I need 30 more seconds. Uh, Okay, so I've been talking. 24 more seconds. Okay. So I'll just repeat. 20 uh, seconds. 16. <laughs> Four, three, two. Okay, all right. It was um uh, yeah i was just saying i'm sure that uh, you could have used more time and and had richer conversations but my hope uh, is is that uh that you were able to to share some things any feedback from some of your conversations that feels relevant you know it reinforces as as we talk with each other um really how valuable it is to have faith connection faith community that uh you know in our little group you know it, it's because of those resources that we have and connecting with one another that becomes a major support yeah so um just being able to talk mm -hmm. about some of these things that maybe we didn't use to talk about it's just so wonderful. Yeah. So praying for people. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And to know that we're not alone mm -hmm. in feeling. Yes. By talking, we support one another and we feel that support. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is a resource, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. Just connecting. Yeah, I think just uh, uh, we, we had a good conversation about clarifying. Mm -hmm. And um, understanding, deeper understanding, and also looking at resources that we have had, and it's that um, in recent situations can challenge for us. Thank you. Well, um, I'm so grateful uh, for being with you this evening. Thank you for having me. Like I said, at the very least, I hope you have some nice fun statistics to tell your friends at dinner parties <laughs> about the relationship between religion, spiritual struggles, and mental health. Um, but I'm grateful for the time and for your space and welcoming me. Um, and yeah, so I think there's, uh, Dick was going to. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Why I want to just accentuate what we just said and did because i really thank you beth for not only sharing your knowledge but sharing your struggles and yourself that is such an important model in terms of what we teach and how we teach what we're doing so thank you very much for that mm -hmm. um, we do have an evaluation form uh, and i'd like if those of you can spend just a couple extra minutes and filling that out we as a committee will be looking at it and we would like to have that as feedback we have used the feedback from other programs to inform us of where we want to go and what we want to do with future programs. Talking about future programs, we do have programs set up for the fall. Uh, we do have, we are talking with Dr. Marcus today about a couple of programs based on feedback that we have received about people's concerns about talking about anxiety. And he is talking about a dialogue format that he hopes to introduce the topic and then maybe have an opportunity to dialogue much more on the topic the second time we go around. So again, thank you for all of you who are here today. Thank you for those of you who are in virtual, whatever it's called, virtual owling, uh, whatever the <laughs> verb is of owling. But I very much appreciate your coming out tonight. And again, have a safe time, have a safe spring, have a safe summer, and we're gonna see you sometime in the fall. Thank you. I will share, with the, I don't know whoever's still here, but- um, So if you come on the other side of the podium, uh, it will be just perfect. Yeah. Uh, I did want to share this. This was from a client of mine when I worked at a psychiatric facility. Um, and uh, I've 
taken it with me. Literally, uh, this woman had bipolar and um, she picked up this piece of cardboard from the floor in the gym and spit this out in about 10 or 15 minutes. And I leave it and share it with you. I have, I have this in my office at school. Um, in the midst of extreme brokenness, there's great beauty. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I hope that a little bit of what we have talked about tonight can, can help you see the beauty in the midst of great pain and struggle. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Just after the quarter.